the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. When our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy, then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. You know, in other times and other places, God's people have felt the hardships of life. They have felt what it is. They have felt the loss when life didn't work out the way they planned. They felt abandoned by God as the temple was destroyed and they were taken into exile. They have felt the injustice of imperial forces occupying the, their land. They have felt what it is to be hungry and marginalized. They have felt the sting of death. And they have felt what it was like to be restored. They have felt the joy of resurrection. They have rejoiced when things turned around. Today, as Christmas approaches, we may be having a hard time feeling and not feeling the Christmas spirit. We may be sad of what has been lost this season. We may be sad that we won't be with our family and that our celebrations will be muted. And of course, it's okay to feel this way. It is where we are at this moment. We might feel like God's people at other times and other places, wondering what is happening and where is God in the midst of all the madness. And yet the psalmist tells us that even in the midst of all of that, our tongues are filled with joy because we know God is coming to restore our future. We know that after death, there is resurrection. As people of faith in this Advent time, we wait for Christ to come. We wait knowing that the joy of God is with us even in our time of sadness. One of our members stopped by this week to drop something off and she said to me, you know, Pastor, when we're able to be together again, it's going to be a wonderful day. We're going to remember now why having worship together is so important and so great. And I share her sentiment today. We can see on the horizon that things are changing. We know that there's a vaccine coming out. We know, however, it will take time, but there is an end in sight. And when we're able to be back together, what a joyful day that will be. In this time, I encourage you to take heart in your faith, to remember that even in this time, there is much to rejoice in, that indeed Jesus Christ is coming into the world, that Christ has become one of us, and Christ is with us in good and bad times. And that brings, and that brings joy to our wandering souls. And that is today's theme, by the way, joy. Today I have this ornament that will go on our tree next to our two others of hope and peace. Oops. Yeah, you know it's live. I think you keep falling down. <laughs> Joy. <laughs> and that's what we'll be talking about a little bit today in today's sermon. I'd like to thank Jim Doyle for being here and recording and Chris Rohr for singing and of course, Janet for playing. We begin this morning with our gathering song, Christ Be Our Light, number 715. Many a heart. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also, and also with you. Let us pray. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the words of your prophets, that anointed by your Spirit, we may testify to your light, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. First reading comes to us from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense and will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are people whom the Lord God has blessed. I will, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all nations. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Now is our time of our lighting of our Advent wreath. It's our third Sunday of Advent today. Of course. We praise you, O God, for, the, for, the, for this victory wreath that marks the day of preparation for Christ's advent. As we light the candles on this wreath, strengthen our hearts as we await the Lord's coming in glory. Enlighten us with your grace that we may serve our neighbors in need. Grant this through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose days draw near. Amen. Let's sing now the first three verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Sinai's 
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So let us pray. Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. Last week, I made my Swedish meatballs for this Christmas. I, it is something that I do every year, and it's one of those things for me that signals that Christmas is near. It's a ritual of mixing all the ingredients together and then forming meatballs. It's part of my preparation as Christmas approaches. And I was especially grateful for it this year, that tradition kept me grounded in remembering that even in this time, Christmas can still be joyful. It can still have significance and importance. It doesn't have to be that all we think about is what it won't be. We can also think about what it will be and what it is. In Advent, we always have two weeks of John the Baptist, and both weeks are pretty much the same thing, about Jesus preparing us for Jesus to come. However, this week in John's Gospel, there is a subtle difference. John tells us that Jesus came to test that John came to testify to Jesus. Have you ever been in a worship service that had a time where people got up and testified? At St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Philadelphia, where I did my internship, they had this as part of their weekly services. There would be a moment where people could get up and tell what God had done for them in their lives or ask the congregation to pray for them. It was my favorite part of those worship services. People would tell stories, both big and small, of how God had been part of their lives that week. Someone's son managed to get off drugs. Someone didn't have enough money for the week, and suddenly it appeared. Someone wasn't feeling well, and God healed them. Someone was feeling defeated from life, and God had shown them the way. We don't do enough of this, actually, in our congregation. We need to tell the stories of what God is doing for us, how God is helping us, how God is getting us through, how God is part of our lives. It is in those stories that we testify to the character of God. And we testify that indeed, God is alive. Every week, our congregation hosts a number of recovery groups. And if you ever went to those groups, you would hear lots of testimony people who were living on the edge, people who were down and out, people who were almost dead, and how God, or what they call their higher power, saved them. How they admitted that they were powerless to their addiction, and God pulled them through it. It's a testimony about the power of God. And that's what John the Baptist is about, testifying to someone else. John is not about pointing to himself. He's not about bragging about all the people that came out to see him or how many people he's baptized. He's about testifying that God is up to something even more powerful than he can provide. 
that God is coming to give us the Holy Spirit, that God is coming to get us out of our funks and our self-imposed prisons, that God is coming to do something so powerful that we will not even be able to believe it. Most of testifying is saying something that others won't believe, right? We tell these stories of how God intervenes, and I think the first thing a lot of people think is that we're just being delusional. And I would argue it's what human beings need, that we as humans have a need to believe in the wonder of God. We need to believe that God is in ordinary things and that it has more meaning and that our lives have more meaning than what appears on the surface. Sure, maybe we could have gotten off drugs because we just came to our senses. However, we know that we are not that powerful on our own. We need something else to propel us forward. We need something else to make our lives make sense. We need something else to get us through this day. In short, we need God. We need God to show up and give us what we cannot give ourselves. We can't give ourselves the joy of being alive and being ordinary. Instead, God comes and tells us that our lives have more meaning than we realize. God shows up in a stable and shows us the beauty of an ordinary human life. There's tons of movies and shows out there, right, of the monotony of life. Usually it's about a person who's unhappy with the everyday things of life. Their job is boring, the kids are a pain, the wife doesn't understand them. And if they could just break free and be the person that they thought they could be, all would be well. And I suppose we all have that feeling from time to time. Christmas is a reminder that it is in the very human life that God comes to save. That all the things we think don't have any meaning have lots of it. That there's beauty and wonder in everyday things. In other words, there's holiness in our lives. That God shows up and God does help us through. And so it would seem like making Swedish meatballs is a kind of a boring, ordinary thing that I do every year. I find it to be much more than that. It is the ritual that I experience the holiness of God. It is in the ritual that I recall all those Christmases of my childhood, my mother sitting next to me rolling her meatballs. It is in the ritual that I am reminded that I'm not alone in this world, that I have a history and a place. And it is in that ritual that I can find joy. It is there that God shows up. And even while I was writing that, I thought, well, that's a kind of a ridiculous thing to say. Making meatballs is just something you do at Christmas every year. There's nothing that makes it special or unique. But that is exactly my point. Jesus becomes one of us to say that human life is more than what we experience. It is infused with the Holy Spirit. It is infused with joy. Life itself is divine. And it is in there that we find God at work. So as you go about your Christmas preparations this year, as you do all the things that you do every year, Remember, Jesus Christ is in all those things, and the power of Christmas is in our ordinary rituals, that they testify to the power of Christ in our lives that bring us joy. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of the day, On the Jordan's Bank, the Baptist Cries, number 249. <laughs> Like flowers that we
God of power and might, shine your radiance and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. God of preachers and messengers, you have entrusted your church with the work of proclaiming good news. Strengthen the witnesses of bishops, pastors, deacons, church musicians, lay leaders, and all people who contribute their prayers and talents to public worship. Embed your word in their hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. God of every living creature, you announce the year of your favor for all of creation. Extend your kindness and relief to endangered animals and plants. Strengthen the human beings who rely on the rhythms of nature to make their living. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all peoples and nations, you plant us as your yoke of righteousness and ask us to care for one another. Be present with the leaders of every nation as they, as they govern. Give them a spirit of righteousness that your goodness and mercy is revealed through their actions. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of exiles and wanderers, you repair what, is once, what, what once was destroyed. We pray for people who have been displaced from their homes by fire, flood, earthquake, or storm. Support the work of Lutheran World Relief, Lutheran Disaster Response, and all disaster relief organizations and their recovery efforts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of the powerful and helpless, you clothe us with strength when, your spirit, when our spirits are weak and weary. Bestow your spirit upon this congregation. Empower us to comfort the people who turn to us in times of need. Make your church a place of refuge and healing. Especially today, we pray, we pray for Ernest, Danny, Kim, Ken, Sal, Valerie, Florence, Teresa, Joe, Vicki, Gail, Tom, Ernie, Karen, Gethsemane Lutheran Church, Carol, Nicole, Carol, John, Dean, Mike, Cindy, Helen, Barbara, Judy, Bill, Liesel, and Karen. We pray for those who grieve, the family and friends of Eric. We remember our homebound, Betty Lee and Florence, and our men and women in the service, Daniel and Joshua. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of sinners and saints, you offer joy even in the midst of our grief. We are grateful for the beloved, imperfect people whose lives testify to your radiant love. Anoint all who mourn with the oil of gladness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Here, our own prayers may be offered aloud or in our hearts. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This Christmas, may Christ's birth bring you joy. May you be filled with joy in the ordinary rituals of the season. And may you know that God is in, with, and through all things. As Chuck Palahniuk says, find joy in everything you choose to do, every job, relationship, home. It's your responsibility to love it or change it. Or Tim Cook, let your joy be in your journey, not in some distant goal. Or Goldie Hawn, we have to embrace obstacles to, re to reach the next stages of joy. Or Helen Keller, joy is a holy fire that keeps our purpose warm and our intelligence aglow. Or Mother Teresa, joy is a net of love by which you can catch souls. Or Emily Dickinson, find ecstasy in life. The mere sense of living is joy enough. Indeed, the incarnation of Jesus tells us that all of life is filled with God, that in ordinary 
the ordinary we find the divine. And I'll leave you with the rock group, Three Dog Nights words, singing joy to the world, all the boys and girls now, joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea, joy to you and me. May your joy be colored with heavenly light. May God's grace be abundant and forgiving. May word and silence weave a holy pattern in your life. And may God bring joy and peace to you and all who are dear to you. Amen. Let's sing together our sending song, The First Noel, number 300. Thank you for joining us today. I hope our words and song brought some joy into your life today. If you would like to support our ministry, you can do that by giving through our PayPal account. The link is in the comments section. I'd like to thank again Jim for recording, Chris for singing, and Janet for playing. And now go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.